Uh, hi, everybody. I'd like to start by acknowledging the first Australians uh, on whose traditional lands ANU resides, at least in meat space. Uh, and I'd also like to acknowledge that uh, they have some important stories to share with us and some important issues to address. And we pay our respects to Indigenous elders, both uh, past and present. Um, we are going to talk about um, how to learn physics, particularly at ANU. Uh, and what physics is a little bit and where it can lead you. If you have questions, just uh, fire them in the chat uh, and uh, Tim or Jay will, will manage to get my attention uh, somehow. And we'll have plenty of time at the end to address questions. Um, and so we can devolve after a bit of a didactic spiel into, into as much question time as you like. Okay, uh, so um, physics. Physicists tend to take a very, big picture view of things. And so I'm going to start by looking at a timeline of all human history. Bam. So here is a timeline of all human history. So 2 million years ago, you know, humans in roughly their current form evolved. And then a very large amount of more or less nothing happened, uh, at least technologically. Uh, and around about a million years ago, fire was discovered. This was very good enabled us to get more out of our food and then very little happened until very very recently we started hanging around in larger groups and we developed things like writing and then bam 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 you know nuclear energy uh, uh smart speakers measuring gravity waves visiting the moon and you know uh tick tock so a physicist looks at that and says something something happened all right. There is nothing. If I was to if I was to try and look at the bit where all of our social process changed and where all of our technology changed, and we went from being animals like pretty much any others, you know, struggling to survive, to this sort of massive happy dominance where we can choose our food, it's the tiniest shaving on the end of that blue bar in time. And ultimately. Uh, what happened there was we started to learn to uh, control our environment. And we did that by looking and, at our environment and understanding our environment. And the, the very bottom of that stack of understanding, the most fundamental layer uh, is physics. So physics is where we notice that there are universal rules for everything. And the, the more we progress in our understanding, the more universal we see. We see that that tiny subatomic particles and cricket balls and babies and gaseous nebula uh, and cells in the body all obey the same very small set of mathematical rules. Uh, and so the job of physics is to learn what those rules are, learn how to learn what those rules are, because we certainly don't have, uh, we haven't completed that job in, by any means, uh, and uh, learn how to apply them. And there is a large number of skills associated with that. Um, in a very practical sense, um, so what, what often drives people to, to physics is a desire to understand. Right? That's, you know, it's, a, it's a natural human drive. It has, as that timeline kind of suggested, of course, worked out very well for us as a species and as a society. So, um, about five years ago, the uh, chief scientists tried to quantify uh, as best they could what the physical sciences, just the physical and mathematical sciences, what they contributed to the Australian economy. So the kind of skill sets that you learn when you, when you study either mathematics or, or physics or especially both of them together, um, they basically came down to this underpins about a quarter of our economy. All right. So it's, it's important in so many facets of our life uh, that it is sort of critical to us functioning as a nation. Uh, and the reason for that is it's not just about going and being a scientist, right? Uh, the skills that you have as a scientist are quantitative skills. You get the ability to um, put numbers on things and analyze numbers. You get to, create models of things that you encounter and you have a chance to be creative uh, and you communicate your results. All these skills of a scientist um, are very useful in everyday life. 
and the, the more quantitative analytical model building ones are particularly strong in the, in the physical sciences. Right. So um, where does physics lead? Uh, I am well aware that an audience to something like an open day tends to be composed of two different kinds of people. The first are students who are kind of keen on learning physics and want to know where that goes or what that's like or how to do it. And their parents who are desperate for their students, their, their, their kids to have a good life. Uh, and so a lot of the questions we get uh, along the lines of what can you do if you study physics? And there aren't amazing aggregates of data from uh, Australian sources, uh, but the Institute of Physics in the UK and the American Physical Society have done very large, long ranging studies on exactly where people go with physics majors. And they all show the same thing, basically. And we have a very similar um, uh, economic outlook and um, education, in fact, to, to these areas. And the short version is in a very uh, narrow time window, people tend to do quite a lot of study. So a lot of people go on and study after they finish their Bachelor of Science equivalent. So they do their Bachelor of Science. So you are then you have a major in physics. A lot of people go on and do an honors degree or a master's degree, or in some cases, even a PhD. Uh, in fact, up to half. Uh, and then the other half split off. Uh, and get a job and the employment rate is very high for them. And this is where the story gets a little bit more complicated because if I say I'm going to go to university and I'm going to study nursing and you say, did you get a job? You usually mean, did you get a job as a nurse? All right. If you say I'm, I'm going to, to a university and I'm going to study medicine, you usually end up in a medicine job or that's at least the goal. Vocational jobs work very differently to, to uh, degrees like science or arts, however. These are more generalist degrees that are trying to give you a suite of transferable skills. They're trying to develop your ability as a critical thinker. They're trying to develop your ability as a communicator. They're trying to develop your abilities as someone who can understand the world around them. And as such, you tend to go into a very large number of different areas. Now, in the physical sciences, you have particularly strong skills in the mathematical side. All right, so there's a, there's a large fraction of people that go into uh, engineering or IT, or, um, but there's also a very large number of people that go into a large range of things. So this is a, this is a bar graph um, from a five-year study, and you can see that it's unusually flat, right? It's not like study physics, become a physicist. If study physics, go into education, go into finance, go into industry or scientific and technical industries, go into government, go into uh, energy and the environment, IT, media, retail, healthcare. Healthcare is, there's a, there's a lot of areas in that that absolutely use and advertise for physicists specifically, not just people in say medicine or um, personal relations, government research, legal and other. So it's a very, very broad um, outcome. Um, so, I am a physicist, right? So I am a, uh, the Associate Director of Education uh, for the Research School of Physics at ANU. And so I, I'm one of these very small number of people that studied physics and then made that study of physics my career. But in fact, most people that study physics go on and use that, uh, that, that knowledge and those abilities uh, in, their, in their real life. Uh, so, People go into a large number of different areas. Are they sought after? Um, yes, they are. So uh, particularly in things like uh, IT and technical industries and uh, various aspects of government policy uh, and finance, um, the quantitative skills from a physicist specifically are in specific demand. And um, the average starting salary for a physics major is the third highest of all degree types and all major types across all degrees. So the demand is real and it's there. Um, that said, exactly which job you go to will be a function of what attracts you rather than necessarily saying, well, I did this degree, so I know exactly where I'm going to go. Okay, so that's, that's physics in general, why you might want to. Aside from, or why you might feel comfortable doing it, comfortable following your interests. 
why ANU? So this is a picture of the ANU from the air. Uh, of course, 2020 is a, a terrible year to try and talk about normal, but normally this is the campus you would work on. Um, some of the particularly unusual things about ANU physics is that we have approximately 150 academics, right? So this is professors, tenured staff, uh, fixed term appointments, postdocs, etc., who are researching in physics. And we have half that number of people who finish as a physics major. So you have a really unprecedented access, personal access to research projects, to working research scientists. So uh, the uh, ANU physics profile is, it's the number one uh, uh, physics group in, in Australia. Um, ANU itself is ranked at the top 20 and physics contributes to that. Um, uh, that's in the world ranking, so we're, we're number one in Australia. Um, and one of the particularly special things about being at ANU is that you get access to research uh, earlier in your um, uh, undergraduate program. Right? So basically, as, as early as you, as you want, you can start doing projects that are real, that are authentic, and are actually learning new things. Um, so we have a large research-led teaching component. Uh, across the last decade, we've had four national teaching awards into physics. Uh, so the national teaching awards go across all areas. Uh, and um, so that's a, that's a stunning result. That's a, an example essentially of the commitment within the uh, education program at, at physics. So while, while there's a lot of research going on, the people engaging with, with the teaching and drawing that research and making it accessible to uh, students um, are very keen and they they do it well they do it quite innovatively so one of the things in that is we have um, award-winning workshop based teaching uh, and we have things like the ANU's makerspace which is a, a, a at a student-led space and so we're, we've uh, pioneered within the university a lot of techniques to really use students time well I'll give you a look at the makerspace the makerspace is essentially, it's, it says, it is what it says. Um, it's a place where anyone, any student can go in and make things. So you go through an induction and then you have a large variety of tools and instruction. It it's, tends to be peer led. So if you want to know how to use a, a particular tool or device, you can ask one of the experts around or you can ask other people. Uh, and you can go in there and We've had student startups coming. We've had people like, I just, I, I think I can do an interesting thing. They figure out how to make it. Um, and people have actually started companies out of this. We also have engagement from our classes. So particular courses might have projects where they send you the makerspace to make something in order to, um, you know, help delve into a particular area. And what this does is it, it really gets over the kind of recipe led you know, do what you're told uh, approach to um, uh, experiments and and design, and you really get your hands dirty. And it has a very, it has a transformative effect on how people approach uh, this kind of work. Uh, physics goes all the way from highly theoretical, you know, like why is the universe the way it is, all the way through to making new things. Right, so the, the engineering, a, a large number of the engineers at the ANU are actually physicists, physicists trained. Uh, and if, the, if an engineer is trying to build something really new, they basically need physics training. If they're trying to make something cheaper, they need a lot of project management training and engineering training. But the, the really new end, you kind of need more along the, of the physicists. And this is the kind of space where those skills are developed. We realize, so this is that, that top, uh, example there is uh, one of our um, first year labs and that bottom picture there is our workshop space. So uh, we don't think it's a very good use of time to get a couple of hundred people together in a room if one person is talking. You might as well video that and show people the video. The real usage of having access to experts is where you get to talk to those experts. Imagine you had five hours with Einstein. Right, it's a thought exercise. Someone's all right, 
got you into a, into a time travel booth and you can go back in time and you can ask Einstein for five hours of his time to like, just sort out anything. Do you a get Einstein to just talk at you for five hours and think, listen, you listen, 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 or do you read that stuff beforehand and then ask questions for five hours? I mean, nearly all of us would say, look, what I want is to ask the questions. You, know, you want that interaction. That's the value of having an expert. If you're just going to listen to them, you might as well just read their book. You know, if you're just going to listen to them, you might as well watch a video. Right. But what having an expert at hand is worth is you can actually interact with them. You can say, like, oh, I don't understand this thing. Can you explain it a different way? You know, oh, how do you do this? So what does that mean? You know, the kind of questions that, that you have will will be different for every person and so what we've done at ANU physics is uh, all our core courses all our core courses the the bits that we would just explain to a room you do before you come to class all right so you've engaged with that material and then a class looks like this and we'll start do you have any questions and the questions will be addressed and then all right we can do an exercise now and so everybody starts working and then the expert comes around and talks to you one by one and so you'll have you'll have one on one time with your lecturers and with tutors and with other people in the research school. Uh, and you can ask them questions, you know, you can really engage and they can they can talk to you and they don't have to worry about what other people are up to. They can just actually help you with wherever you're at. And this is a vastly better use of your time. Uh, and since we started doing it, people have had their grades go up. The, the level of learning has has gone up by an entire grade. And so we've really committed to this process. It is also um, in a in a COVID world, um, uh, working very well online. So this this same workshop process works uh, pretty much the same online. But we're very keen, hopefully in the future, and hopefully you have the opportunity to actually come to class where we can have that that one on one interaction, and also you can have that same kind of interaction in labs. So our current lab situation is we are sending labs out to people and you, you do things and we interact with you remotely. Obviously, the more we can draw in under normal circumstances, please let it be. Um, we've got some really exciting things for you either way. Okay, so this here is not our teaching space. This is the student space. So connected to that teaching space is a space where you can come and work, all right? So this is, there are, there are couches, there's a, a coffee machine, there's a kitchen, there's, you know, facilities, there's power, there's internet, all that kind of stuff. There's whiteboards. And when we, when we have our tutorials, we just schedule them in here. And when we schedule them in there, it doesn't mean like only those people can be there. Everyone can be there all the time. And so we have, you get to talk to your peers, you get to talk to people who did this course the previous year. We have this sort of vertical integration uh, of peer things and um, other areas are actually very jealous of the space and um, it's uh, working very well again. It's even better when people can actually be there. Um, okay, logistically, you might be wondering, all right, I want to do physics, how do I enroll? It's very simple at first year. At first year, you want to do the physics courses. So you want to do physics one and physics two. If you want to start in second semester, you can actually do both of these at the same time. Uh, and you also have to do mathematics. So our main advice is do the highest level mathematics you can, because by the time you get to the end of third year, you're going to need all these mathematical skills. Uh, so first year, that's it's as simple as that. And then second year, we have, um, where's my cursor? We have four core courses, two per semester. And also you have to do, you have to do oh, applied mathematics as well. Um, so this would be uh, ordering differential equations and partial differential equations. Now, um, from that core, all right, the third year spreads out. So in the third year, you tend to use all the things you've learned in different combinations and in different contexts. Uh, and that is that synthesis is what we call that year. So we've got foundations, then core, then synthesis. That synthesis is where you go from technically having seen some things to actually being able to use them because you've used them out of context. And you know there's a huge difference between having heard something and being able to just use it cold in, a, in a, some unusual situation. And we have this, sort of plan progression of how we get you from step A all the way through to, to step C. Um, at that third year level, physics, because it's the most fundamental sort of science, 
it enables a lot of others. And so if you were particularly interested in say, uh, earth or environmental science, you know, oceanography, things like that, climatology, then you would tend to, at this third year level, you would start to take courses in that area. If you're interested in astrophysics, you would tend to start to take uh, astrophysics courses. Uh, if you're interested in biophysics or physical chemistry or something like that, then that third year is where you start to, to branch out from that core. You, there is also room to take some, you know, astrophysics or chemistry or so forth in the, in the first couple of years. So the, the first year of a science degree is quite general. The second year you specialize a little bit and then the third year you actually sort of develop and flower. Okay, um, so that's, that's the sort of how to. So I think we might start throwing it out to Q&A. Uh, in, in an easy world, we would just chat, but in this world, if you type it into the chat box, it will come up on the, on the webinar and um, Jane, Tim can make sure I don't miss one. Uh, Tim, no, do you want to? Yeah. I, shall I chair? Shall I chuck the questions at you? How about you chair? Fantastic. Um, alrighty. So we've had a couple of questions come through. So let's fire those off. Uh, this one in particular is about the slide that you've got up. Uh, the question is: Are the advanced courses such as QFT, so quantum field theory, and general relativity, better to do uh, as an undergrad or as a postgraduate? Uh, excellent question. So. The quantum field theory course that we have in our in our third year is essentially unique around the world in that everybody else does it at master's level or higher. Uh, and so it's a it's a first course in that. And the reason that exists is that so many of our students were really keen to just get into it as soon as they could. And so we found ourselves doing this as a research topic year after year after year. And so we finally said, all right, why don't we make it a formal course? Um, that said, it's quite clear that it is perfectly reasonable to do it in a postgraduate setting. And lots of like students around the world do it that way. Uh, and that course, even that course precisely as is, would make a perfectly fine master's course as indeed double badged, general relativity similarly, all the third year courses, apart from the ones in that slightly darker blue there. So you can tell they're a third year course because the code starts with a three. Those slightly darker blue ones, um, uh, what we call the core courses. So if we want to get you a physics major, we recommend you take those. And the others are all optional. They're all good. I mean, I, I, it's, it's a sad fact of life that you can't do all the things that are fun to do. Uh, there's just not enough time. There's not enough degrees to do all the stuff you want. So you just have to make a call uh, and you will be definitely missing out on cool things and you'll be definitely doing cool things. And it doesn't matter because in the end, you know, you can always catch up on, on any topic and, that's the normal life of a lifelong learner. Does that answer your question? Just if you want to follow up, feel free to just elaborate. Uh, so this question is in relation to the jobs and opportunities that you have following a physics degree. Uh, the question is, what are some examples of scientific and technical industry work? Okay, uh, so um, we have uh, our department. So the scientific and technical industry work is usually for someone who's got a little bit of research experience. And so it's usually for someone who's done an honors degree and or a PhD uh, as a rule, because the, the, the skills that you develop there are the ones that are more directly applicable. But for example, we have had uh, several spin-off companies come out of my department, the Department of Quantum Science, which is one of 10 in the research school. Um, and people have, uh, so one of them was Quintessence. And so we had PhD students who went straight out of their PhD into this company that was connected to their research, actually. Um, Quintessence uh, yeah, began as a quantum cryptography company. So the idea of using quantum mechanics to have unbreakable codes uh, and they have um, key generation, they do software and hardware. Uh, another one is uh, more recently uh, liquid instruments. Uh, so there were, there are a large number of lab devices that were very specialist devices uh, that all cost a lot of money. And it turns out there's a, a sort of fundamental box that with a bit of software, you can reconfigure into each of these devices. And so what this company did was it basically said, here is a box and an iPad and you just, you press a button and you've got a new box. You know, it's like 
I've got an oscilloscope. No, now I've got a function generator and, I, and it's, you know, it's, it's sort of iPad style and you can, you can build high level research equipment you know, in software effectively. And that's why it's called liquid instruments and, and they spun off um, recently. And again, uh, a whole pile of people who worked with that kind of technology went on and, and went into that. Uh, there are people going into laser companies. I mean, I'm talking about things from my department, right? So the, the, the stories I know well, like I said, we're a tenth of the whole thing. And so uh, Australia has compared to say a Germany or, or a China, a much smaller industrial base, but there is still a lot of opportunities uh, to, to go on and join companies uh, and or even start companies. So a question, Joe, that's come in that um, perhaps follows on from that is, does physics relate to renewable energy research um, areas like solar or hydrogen, or would that be better in a chemistry or engineering type degree? Uh, so m many of the physicists that I went through with, I uh, went straight into that area at ANU. So um, the typical rule is if you're talking about how do I make a cheaper manufacturing uh, solar cell, you tend to need engineering background to do that. If you're like, how do I make a higher efficiency solar cell? You tend to need a physics background to do that. And so uh, one of the common degrees at ANU is actually science engineering, where you, you, you take both degrees at the same time effectively. It takes five years, but you get a full engineering degree and a full science degree. Uh, and that's uh, an amazing combination for entering technology like that. So we have a, a thriving uh, solar thermal and photovoltaic um, uh, community made of both uh, physicists and engineers and chemists, because there's a lot of material science going in there as well. Uh, there's a new material science masters being designed. There's at ANU, there's something called the Energy Change Institute, which is a cross college cross or discipline institute and physics is definitely one of the core ways of getting involved in that area yes um, another question that's come through i'll also put a, a link because we can't really answer questions specifically about um, admissions and enrollment but just generally joe can you talk about students who've come through perhaps not straight from school or not from australian schools how credit might be recognized um, or what other experiences some students have when they come to the course? Right. So I, I don't actually have expertise on the sort of the, the levels for getting in, but essentially uh, what happens is if you come in from a slightly, um, uh, you know, non-stereotypical input, uh, the discipline areas are asked. So I will get, I will get across my desk here is a student who has this background, will they be able to manage first year physics? So the admissions will handle whether you're, you can come into the degree uh, and then other, is, is this the right background for physics? I'll make a call, I'll, I'll look at it, maybe I'll end up talking to them. Or sometimes people come in and they've had some industry experience like, well, can they skip first year physics and go straight to second year physics or something like that? And, and we, we do that on an ad hoc basis. Uh, in general, everything is possible, right? So we don't have a bureaucratic approach. We, our main goal in letting people into courses is to make sure that they will have a good time, you know, that they are capable of progressing well in that course. We have a, we have, um, you know, uh, a well thought through progression. And if people are coming in, we just want to make sure that that's going to work well. Um, another question that, that comes on to that about um, capability is, is the maths question. What if, so someone's asked if they've done one type of maths in New South Wales, will they be able to do it? Um, what do you say to that kind of question? For, for anyone who may or may not have done the, the right maths. The right maths. High school. So the, the long-term picture is you need to get up several levels of maths, no matter what you started at. And so if you started at say, you know, not the top maths or the next maths, but the next math down, you've got a little bit of ground to make up, but we have pathways for doing that. So we have pathways where you can do sort of intermediate levels of maths through your first year and a half uh, and sort of, sort of get you up. So it'll be, you'll be doing more mathematics courses at university, you have a little bit less breadth, but you'll, you'll be able to catch up to the point where everyone else is. The higher level math requirements in the physics side actually happen a bit later. So you can do 
the first year maths, um, you know, the, the first physics course with quite a low level of maths. So the reason we have this co-requisite of maths is to make sure that the next course goes well. You know, so we're trying to make sure that you're, you're doing the maths in time so that the next course works out well, right? So we have a little bit of, a little bit of flexibility in doing that. Um, in extreme cases, you can do things like a catch up over the summer, you know, if you're a full course and it's hard to get back. And, and we have sort of established pathways for doing that. Um, in general, we recommend that people just be ambitious, you know, have a go and get support. Uh, because there's a lot of people who will support you do well and you know um, first year is a good time to try hard because everything else isn't quite in general second year is harder than first year and third year is harder than second year in, in just the same way that you know year 11 and 12 was harder than year 19 and so on um, and in, in exactly the same way uh, for many many years you know generations of students have gone through this curve and it's been fine all right, so it being harder is not a problem. You know, we know how people work. Uh, but first year is actually, you've got a bit of space there, you know? And so that's a good, it's a good time to say, all right, I'll, I wanna do physics. I will equip myself and go hard. Uh, we don't have any more questions in the Q and A. So if anyone wants to add more questions, please do. Um, but Joe, here's a question for me. What do you wish that students were asking you more of, perhaps um, in that week before they start first year physics? What are successful study strategies? You know, um, I think there's a there's a a transition in owning your own education that happens as you go through school. You know, when you're when you're in school, stereotypically education is sort of done to you. You know what I mean? Like you. You, you're told what to do, you're told where to do it, you're told essentially how to do it. And then when you come into university, you're given more and more freedom. And sometimes that doesn't work out well because people, uh, if it doesn't work early on, they go, oh, you know, and they, 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 they hide in their shell. Uh, we have huge support systems for helping people take charge of their own thing to, to help people use their time efficiently right it's the nature of learning that you spend most of your time stuck right when you get it you're done that, that's that's success and so most of the work is trying to unstick yourself and naturally you can get badly stuck and frustrated all right and and most people develop strategies for dealing with that and they learn to access our resources and the earlier people kind of lean on us, you know, then the better life they have, essentially, you know, like they, they don't get frustrated because once they got stuck, they came to us, we got them over that bump and, you know, they, they kept going. And so I guess, um, how should I go about this once I'm, once I'm enrolled? Okay, I'm enrolled now, you know, what, what are good practices? You know, those, are, those are important questions to ask. And even just asking those questions gets your head in the right space, I think. Um, perhaps, uh, oh, perhaps a Where question. Um, we just lost the, the screen there. That's what confused me. Um, yeah. Perhaps if there's, um, if you're speaking to a, a parent of a student who's thinking of going into physics, what, what do you have to say to someone who's sort of weighing up the opportunities of, of what, what kind of course, why, what would you say to them? I, okay, uh, well, I'd, I'd listen to them. I mean, a, a parent is a very broad <laughs> term, right? It's basically most humans. Um, if I were to generalize, I would say most parents, uh, they want to see the they want to imagine a specific life for their kid. You know, like they're like, are you doing that? That's going to lead there. And I can see that. So that feels safe. You know? And I understand that. That makes sense. You know, I'm a, I'm a kid. I'm a, I'm a parent too. I, I want to see, I want to see my son, you know, doing a particular thing rather than just, ah, what's going on. But the, the space of things that people do with their lives is so much bigger than, you know, 
doctor, lawyer, nurse, you know, astronaut, fireman, you know, um, all the, the, you know, the job titles, you, 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 you go through a list of jobs. It, some of them, I don't even understand some of the words, right? The, the world is big and complicated. Uh, and the thing that um, gives, the, gives people the ability to engage with the world like that is flexibility. You know, it's the ability to process new information. It's the ability to learn new things. It's the kind of skills, like most jobs are generalist jobs, I guess is what I'm saying. Uh, and so you, <laughs> by saying, hey, I really want to see this specific path for your kid, in some senses, you're hoping that path's going to work out, right? Whereas if you say, get this great big skill set and you can go anywhere, should feel like safety as well that makes sense on the, on the flip side um someone's asked now about about research um if you want to really become a, a, a physicist um at a uni so what percentage the question is what percentage of phd students i guess students who finish their phd having studied first a degree in physics get jobs as researchers or what or even perhaps you might be able to talk about who stays on here at anu um, right uh, well, actually, after you finish your PhD, we encourage you to move. You know, so mobility is a standard um, uh, element of a research career. You want people to have experiences in a couple of different places. So I, I did my original degree at ANU, and I've come back to ANU, but I went via other places. You know, and uh, that is seen as a as a good thing to do. You know, get get away from your original nest. Right. Uh, of a PhD, about uh, well, at least half just go and get other employment immediately. Um, about, I think, a quarter go on into another research job. And by that, I mean like a fundamental research job, you know, rather than say in a company or something. Uh, Sorry, what on, do you I, mean by a fundamental research job? I mean like a postdoctoral position at a university, say. Okay. Uh, and uh, maybe a quarter of them in the end. So we're talking in the end, something like 10% of people who do a PhD actually end up living a life that looks like research, like science research. And that's not because, uh, you know, everyone wants to do that and that's the number that succeed. It's because not everyone wants to do that. A lot of people do their PhD, which is a huge accomplishment with all sorts of skills associated with it and say, whoa, that was big. I think I'd like to, you know, I'd, I'd actually like to make something or, you know, I'd like to get into policy or I'd like to join a, you know, big IT company or something. And they go do that. And they're happy. And, and all the people that went, I went through honors with did that and they're very happy and, you know, doing well. Um, and so it's, it's a combination of inclination and opportunity that leads you to choose the research life. I usually encourage people who are interested in that to, to go for it. I mean, I went for it. I love it. I love my job. I love my life. Right. And all, all the people that I work with also love their job. Right. So it's a great job. If you think I must research and nothing else interests me, then it's a very stressful thing. It's like, say, I wish to become an actor, you know, like it's not necessarily the great life that you expect. Right. But if you are into, into research, and you do it knowing I could do that or a bunch of other things, you can have a great time with it. And so I recommend that people do kind of look around and understand how much in demand they are, you know, and the options they have and think about that very realistically. Uh, and otherwise just enjoy the research that they get to do of, of which you can do quite a lot, you know. And um, we've got a few questions here. I was also just thinking there's opportunities to do research projects even while you're in undergrad. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, and you get at ANU because of our sort of fairly weird staff student ratio, you get real personal attention for those research projects. So it's not, it's not like you're doing a thing. It's like you're actually in a group at the time, you know, a research group and you're, you're seeing what they're doing and you're, you're part of it for that course. Mm -hmm. um, Alicia asks, are the class sizes for physics small? And I guess perhaps 
uh, she hasn't defined small, but perhaps you can put a number on it. Um, and does this matter when choosing a uni? Um, look, uh, our first year class, the first year class is always the biggest class because it's shared with the most people. There's a lot of people doing our first year physics who are not planning to do more physics. It's just an element of their thing. Our first year classes are typically uh, 120 to 180 size plus we have a, an engineering cohort as well um in those you get one-on-one -on -one attention from people every workshop so you get normally in in some universities you'll have a class of 300 and there'll be one person up the front and if you if you divide like the amount of time you get of that person's attention it's essentially zero right um in ours you will get um five to ten minutes per workshop of the lecturer and five to 10 minutes of other people as well. And so you actually get a lot of personalized attention. By the time you get into second year, class sizes are halved. By the time you're into third year, class sizes tend to have halved again. And the reason for that is that second year, you've only got the people who wanted to do physics. At third year, you've got choice. So now, so now you've got sort of self-selection uh, and, and the, the sort of staff-student ratio only goes up again. Um. Another question is, is, is programming knowledge needed or recommended to, to be doing physics? Do you need to already have understand programming? You do not. Uh, you do need to be able to program to, to function as a quantitative person in a modern world. Uh, and so uh, in the long past, we used to have courses where you would learn how to do computational stuff. And what we found was people who were like, but I don't know how to comp do computational stuff wouldn't do those courses. And so it tended to just kind of accelerate the skills of people who already knew how to do it. So what we do now is we integrate computational stuff into our normal programs as it comes up naturally. So when a computer is the easy way to do something, we use the computer. So one of the, one of the inherent traits of, of a physicist is they cheat whenever they can. Uh, you know, we're, we, we like efficiency. And so if there's an example that's just better to do by computer, we show you how to use the computer to do it. And now you've got that skill to do it that way. And so from then on, you know, uh, you've, you've got those skills. And we have a, we have a it's, it's not um, very explicit when you look at the courses, but we actually have a progression of computer skills that we, we have stacked through those courses to get you where you need to be. And then at the end, there's actually still a fairly large spectrum of how much computer you might specialize in, you know, some, some areas use it more or less than others, but we let that happen naturally. And we support you all the way. Um, and in terms of that uh, knowledge that you need to start off with, in terms of starting, a, some Kate has asked, is there any benefit or is it important to start a physics course straight after high school rather than taking a gap year? Would you, you know, would there be something to fear in, in losing a year's time or whatever fell out of your head after year 12? No, there's, there's, a, there's a, a general fear. Oh, if I don't keep at this grindstone, I'll miss the boat. And I often tell people there is no boat. Or if there is a boat, they go every hour on the hour, right? So um, take some time to get your head together, fine. You might find that it would be good to spend a couple of weeks before semester starts remembering, you know, how mathematics works or, you know, there's a bit of revision that is appropriate in that kind of situation, but it's easy enough to do. Uh, and I think is easily outweighed. Like the, the need to do that, I think is easily outweighed just by being refreshed, you know? The difference between someone who's at uni and knows what they want and why, and like, no, I'm gonna do this now, uh, compared to someone who's just kind of fallen into it because they feel like they can't take a rest, uh, is huge, you know, just in terms of the energy they apply to their, to their learning. And in the end, it's about the work that you do. So. Um, and one, one more question here is just about uh, if you were going to be doing a PhD, what would be the, um, the progression? Do I need, Sanika asked, do I need a master's or honours year to apply to, be a, to do a PhD or just a bachelor's? And perhaps you can talk us through how that, what that looks like in terms of time. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So, so a bachelor's degree uh, is three years. And then you have your bachelor of, say, science. There are other degrees you can get a major in physics in, for example, the Bachelor of Philosophy or Bachelor of Science Advanced. But let's say you've done a Bachelor of Science, then you, you get your degree, well done, um, your BSc. 
if you want to go on and, and learn some more and have a bit of a research experience, you have two options. The first is an honours degree. An honours degree is actually fairly specific to Australia in that around the world, most people are expecting you to do masters in this case, but Australia has a one year thing, which is called an honours, uh, or there's a two year thing called a masters. And in both those cases, there's some courses and mainly a research project. And that research project is with, within a, within a group, you have a supervisor who is an active researcher and you have to actually do some original research. And of course you're, the whole process is guided to support you in doing that. Uh, and then you write a thesis and that thesis is essentially how you're marked at the end. Like, and you, you deliver uh, a seminar on your research and you deliver this, this essentially a report, right? Um, from the honors or masters, whichever one you do, you can then go on and do a PhD anywhere in the world. We've had people go everywhere and we've had people come from everywhere. The PhD is, or nominally it's three years, that's very short by world standards. In practice, nearly everyone spends three and a half. Uh, you get a government scholarship typically to do this. And so you have, you have a little tax-free income. It's, you know, it's, it's not great, but it's enough to live. You know, people are happy. Um, and more importantly, you, you get to just do your thing for three years uh, or three and a half years or four years up to maybe seven, depending on whether you get extensions. Um, if you go overseas, it'll tend to be seven to 10. Um, but you can, you know, it's a slightly different experience. Um, uh, and then at the end of that, again, you write a big thesis. You hand, hand your thesis, it's now judged by international experts. And if they all say, yep, you're a doctor now, then you are a doctor so-and-so. Uh, and they can't take that away from you ever again. And that, that's the fact that you can pull off a project like that says something independent of the topic, right? Uh, and the fact that you did it in physics says some things about, you know, uh, a whole bunch of other, skills that you might have and therefore a phd in physics is a very useful qualification uh in into various areas yeah and then you know if you want to become a research scientist after your doctorate comes post doctorates and that's that's basically just a job like any other you know um typically fixed term contracts around the world there's a sort of whole supply of these as typically to work on individual projects so a researcher might apply the money from their government and they say, yes, go and do this. And then they'll hire someone to, you know, do the, the coalface research and that's the postdoc. Um, we don't have any more questions. We have another 10 minutes until we're um, cut out. So if anyone, out. <laughs> yeah, if anyone does have, have more questions about that um, or anything, please put it in the Q and A. Um, Tim just mentioned in the chat that um, what you do, Joe? So perhaps you could just explain what you do. And you're not a you're not a doctor. You're a professor. Um, if you're oh, using yeah. fancy titles, how does that work in a university system? If for people who aren't um, so so aware of that, your doctor. If you've got a doctorate, if you have a PhD, uh, and then uh, basically there's a you can get a job in the university, and there's a promotion system, uh, and the sort of second highest one's called uh, in Australia is called uh, associate professor, and the top level is called professor. Um, so my, I have many jobs, lots of different hats, for example, this one. Um, so, uh, on one hand, I'm in charge of the education program in physics. And so I do a lot of teaching. Uh, on the other hand, I'm in charge of a research group and my research group, uh, has three postdocs in it and a bunch of PhD students and a bunch of honors students. And they're all working on different projects. The general area is quantum science. So I'm a, I'm a theorist in, in quantum physics. I'm interested in computational methods. Uh, so I, I have a, a computational package that's used by um, thousands of people around the world. Uh, I look at how to design uh, quantum computers. I look at how to build sensitive measuring devices out of uh, um, ultra cold gases. I look at uh, uh, how to make measuring devices out of floating glass mirrors on light. I look at, um, uh, how one can use computers to design experiments. So rather than, rather than sort of having a clever idea and going for it, getting a computer to try a billion, billion combinations and show you the optimum way. And sometimes those optimum ways are crazy, something you'd never imagine, and yet it's the best way to do it. You know? And that's kind of fun too. Uh, so yeah, we have, a, we have a lot of things on the go. Um, 
and that's that's one group within one department within the whole school and the school isn't where it is there's also the astrophysics school and the earth sciences and you know engineering and so forth so there's a, there's a lot of choice on on what kind of stuff to go to Joe, as we start to wrap up this conversation, we've still got time to answer some questions, so put them in the Q&A. Um, so we've got a question that's just come through uh, about work and lifestyle, which is exactly what I was going to ask you about. So the question is, can you work part-time in ANU, in or off campus, while taking physics? Um, and how do you balance your work and study, uh, that kind of student lifestyle approach? Um, well, as always, with difficulty, because people are ambitious, um, a lot of people work part time and study full time. And if that sounds intense, it is, I guess. Um, it depends how much money you need to live, I guess. So people are in different circumstances. Uh, studying part time is very normal. Lots of people do it. Uh, the full time load is four courses a semester. Um, three courses a semester counts as full time for um, you know, uh, government purposes, you know, for visas and for, um, uh, you know, access to, uh, subsidies, etc. you know, um, send a link, um, uh, two courses or less counts as part-time. Right? And in the end, all you have to do is put the courses together. So you can, you can take eight years to get a three year degree if you want. And there's no disadvantage whatsoever. In fact, it's, easier it just takes longer so whatever whatever works for you and also it's possible to accelerate i strongly recommend you don't take five courses in a semester but if you think i really want to get this done or you had to drop something you can do things like take up a course over the winter break or more easily over the summer break because it's longer um, so there's there's lots of flexibility built into the system and i might just add on to the back there that um ANUSA, the ANU Students Association for undergraduate and PASA for postgraduate students uh, do provide a range of resources to help you balance that work study lifestyle as well. Uh, I've got a question for you, Joe. And it's, we've spoken a lot about the course content in particular, but what about the lifestyle outside of the classroom within uh, the, the physics cohorts? Do students interact with each other or are they studying completely independently of each other? Uh, it's, it's, there are of course, um, subcultures. Uh, so some people, some people are working really hard at a job and just coming into their course. There is a large cohort that essentially go through together, however, uh, and a lot of friendships are made. You saw that student space, that space has no other purpose. And so a lot of people kind of, it's their semi home away from home. Um, they, they function there. There's a, a active physics society, which over time we're going to actually be supporting more, um, particularly um, uh, in a world where we may not have as much contact. We're going to make sure that we get, you know, the, the, the social needs met. Um, the student association and the faculty of science have uh, lots of events. There's, there's you know, uh, public events and so forth. So there's there's a lot of option there. We had a raised hand. Nope, the hand looks like it's disappeared. Came and went. So as we start to wrap up this conversation, if there are any last questions, chuck them in the Q and A function. Joe, if people want to learn more about how and why to study physics at the ANU, what can they do? So um, I wanted to make this point that if you suddenly think of something you wanted to ask, nobody's going anywhere. Um, if you have questions about how to enroll to the university, uh, you should talk to admissions, right? And if there are tricky questions, they'll refer it to the College of Science. And if there are tricky physics questions there, they'll refer them to me. If you have questions about studying physics, um, you, can, you can email me directly. Um, and, uh, you know, we can set up a meeting or I can just reply if it's a sort of easily codified question, but I'm very happy to talk to anyone anytime. Uh, so, uh, joseph.hope at anu.edu.au. If you Google Joseph Hope ANU, you land me there on the first click. Um, or Joe Hope, uh, ANU, you land me there on the first click. Um, 
and of course you can you can find us through the open day contacts as well with seconds to spare any last questions And just so everyone knows, Joe's email address is in, uh, just been put into the chat by Jay. Um, so copy that out before we wrap up. Uh, Joe, seeing as we don't have any final questions, but we've still got another couple of minutes of your time, thought I might ask um, if there's anything that we haven't already addressed uh, this, this afternoon that you would like the audience to know about. You know, I think we've covered the basics. Um, uh, a lot of people ask me questions like, I'm really interested in X, what should I study? And I think at first year, this is very easy, you know, like you, you pick your subjects. If you're interested in physics, do your physics and your maths. If you're interested in astro, add astro. If you're interested in chemistry, add chemistry. The first year is deliberately broad like that choice. Uh, and then, you know, you've got a whole year to develop a backup question or a secondary question. Um, and there's, there's no sort of hidden surprises there. So essentially I advise people to just follow your interests, you know, at first year and then follow your revised interests as you go. Uh, 